Thanks, Tim, and hello, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to present today um, on a topic that's the, in, in my area of passion, and that's technical and engineering design. Um, so I'll be running through in quite a degree of depth today, 60601-1. So uh, apologize for the high density of information, but we will make the slide deck available to anyone who wishes to receive it to avoid having to feverishly take notes as we go along. So I will be moving quite quickly through some- And actually topics. Jeff, on, on that but point, sorry, of... Jeff, on that point, I have actually emailed just four or five minutes ago. I did actually email all the participants uh, a copy of the of the presentation um, and it would be great if somebody uh, if you have received it um, that's you know everyone uh, if you have received it just pop in something into the chat panel to let me know that you've actually got it that'd be great thank you okay just uh, a slides that uh, those who've joined us before will have seen before just examples of medical devices and in this instant specific instance active medical devices, which generally are those that are powered by electricity. And in this day and age, the vast majority of them will incorporate active electronics, including a microcontroller. So this is just a small selection of products that we've developed at Genesis to give you some idea of the wide range of what active medical devices look like. All of these devices are subject to the requirements of IEC 60601-1. Another slide we'll um, very briefly visit that uh, everyone's probably seen before, and this relates to the product development process. Um, by way of um, explanation of where 60601-1 fits in, it's essentially across the full systems development activity. So pretty much from the start to the finish, 60601-1 applies uh, in some form or other from design requirements right through to verification and validation. So where does 60601-1 fit in? This is the headline set of standards that apply to medical device development. And as noted, there are many others, but these are the key ones. So 60601-1 is the key standard that relates to basic safety and essential performance. And I'll be explaining what those concepts mean it's careful to note that it's not electrical safety. Um, it tends to get misquoted that people think it's, oh, 60601-1 is only electrical safety. It's actually safety of electrical equipment. So it's, as you'll see through the presentation, there is lots in this for other than the electronics guys, the industrial designers, mechanical engineers, mechatronics engineers uh, have a lot of a role to play. In fact, in some products, a greater role than the electrical. So in terms of the standard, um, I've noted the versions, uh, the current version edition 3.1 is called, but also note there's been an amendment that's come out quite recently that um, some uh, of you may not be aware of. Um, there was going to be a major update in 2024, but unfortunately the powers that be have decided that an amendment is required. So we have to deal with that and it does have some quite substantial changes, particularly in the use of indicator lights. So I'd um, advise everybody to make sure that they're across amendment to uh, while we wait for the new edition. And, and Jeff, just while you're on that um, indicator lights, like that doesn't sound very complicated. Um, you know, why can't you just put a red LED in if you want a red LED, you know, just, yeah. just, to, just to give people a flavor of how pedantic these things can be. Good loaded question there, Tim. The issue is the use of warnings versus alarms versus status indications. And the standard is very specific on that. Unfortunately, it's also vague and it tends to not discriminate between red and orange, which I think is a problem. But bottom line is I have seen probably more devices that use indicator lights incorrectly than I've seen devices that use them correctly. The simple dumb things like putting a red LED on there as an indicator for other than an alarm, for example. So this is a, a yeah. good example of the nitty gritty detail that you need to be across. You could end up with a fail in your 60601-1 verification process right towards the end of your project because your indicator lights are the wrong color. That may cause a great degree of grit, 
grief, certainly in terms of going through all the documentation and correcting it all. It's a good example of where it's really important to be very pedantic when determining compliance against this standard. So just a bit of a summary of what it covers, and this is not uh, slavishly in order of what the standards address, standard addresses, but it is to a degree uh, somewhat prioritised in order. Um, noting the electrical hazards, I said this goes well beyond electrical, but some of the biggest hazards, a potential cause of death arise from electrical to electrocution, but there are very substantial mechanical hazards right through usability, biocompatibility, etc., etc. So just to give you a little bit of a flavour of the breadth of coverage of the standard, even including items like labelling and documentation. So virtually no one in, involved in the development or regulatory process uh, escapes coverage in this standard. Tim, let me know if I'm going too slow or too fast. It's fine. So just to go into a little greater depth on medical electrical equipment and how it is defined in 60601. Um, interesting to note that it doesn't include battery powered devices where there is no mains connection or mains derived connection. However, this standard is broadly applied to battery powered devices. So I think that's an indication the standards probably got a little bit out of date in terms of the way electrical equipment in the medical space is going. So you certainly can apply it to battery powered devices and the regulators will expect you to have applied it to battery powered devices, even though strictly speaking, in accordance with clause 3.63, uh, they're out of scope. And as I mentioned before, you're typically dealing with devices with embedded microcontrollers and that brings into play a reference or a, the standard calls up the relevant software standard. And I'll just make a comment there, Jeff, you know, for those who are sort of new to the community is that that's why we call it the active med, uh, active med tech community, because generally um, devices with those uh, embedded microcontrollers and batteries and power sources are active. Um, you can actually have medical devices um, that have energy sources other than electricity, um, but they're very few and far between. So 99% of the time it's involving these devices. And there are many aspects of the standard that are applicable to non electrically powered devices, but this specifically calls up the requirements for electrically powered devices. In terms of the fundamental objective, it's a, a myth to think that the objective is to comply with the regulations and to get certified. The fundamental objective is to produce equipment that's safe, bug free, reliable, effective, etc. So it's a good point of view to adopt that you're not trying to comply with the standard, you are trying to produce safe and effective equipment. And if you do that, and if you follow the standard as you guide, your guide, you fulfill both objectives of having safe equipment and complying with the standard. Now, there are a couple of very important concepts. Sorry, Jeff, you mentioned earlier that Sorry, um, in terms of safety, that um, this is about safety uh, more generally, but it, it's really um, highlighting the safety aspects that relate to electrically powered devices. Are there other um, standards across the regulatory spectrum that do more generally relate to safety? If, you know, if you had a, a, an inert device without any electricity that you would need to apply? There definitely are. I couldn't point to one that specifically is the equivalent of this for non-electrical devices, but a lot of the standards that 6601-1 calls up apply out of this domain. Really good example being related to sterility and cleanliness, for example. Um, I think you probably could go as far as to choose to apply this standard or aspects of it to non-electrical devices. If you don't have a standard that defines the safety requirements of a non-electrical device, you could actually use sections of this standard in lieu and you, you won't be penalised for that if there is no other appropriate standard. But generally speaking, if you're dealing with non-electrical stuff, you should be looking for the standards that apply in that domain. The, the concept of basic safety is, is the, and the definition, I won't read it out slavishly, but it is effectively the equipment safe to use or the risk of hazards more, more explicitly is acceptably low for normal and single fault conditions. The single fault conditions is particularly important 
you need to do an analysis of any design to make sure that any single fault condition can't lead to an unacceptably risky situation. The other key aspect is essential performance, which is effectively everything other than basic safety that is required for the device to be safe and effective in performing its function. So the definition of the essential performance of your device is a key aspect to that. So in a, I, won't slide, I won't go into that in depth. That would be another whole uh, webinar to talk about that. But it's probably a fairly good view to say, what does this device have to do to do what we claim it to do to fulfill its clinical function, be that therapeutic, diagnostic, or otherwise? You'll see I've got uh, throughout this presentation references into the documents, and I've also identified documents you should be considering producing during your uh, development process. I won't go through those in detail, but they are available in the slide deck if you want to go into the detail of that. And certainly if anyone's got any specific question, I'll circle back to those slides by way of explanation, but I won't spend time today going through in detail. I will just run out of time. So looking at the different perspectives, so the CTO, Chief Technical Officer, Chief Engineer, and indeed any member of your engineering team should be striving to adopt a, an engineering best practice approach. If they do that, they will find very close alignment with many of the aspects that are defined in the standard. This standard doesn't actually specify a methodology for engineering or design. It specifies tests that need to be complied with in order to produce a safe product that complies with the standard. But you can deduce from that what the methods are that you should be applying to achieve that. And in essence, they are best practice engineering. So there's a very strong alignment with the engineering team applying best practice to achieving compliance with the standard. Um, particular to note, it's impractical to say, we'll rip through our design as fast as we possibly can and do this regulatory compliance stuff later. Simply doesn't work. Um, the life cycle approach precludes it and you will inevitably find you have a lot of non-compliances if you're not aware of what the requirements are at the start of the engineering process. So why does a CEO care? Well, the CEO will want to make sure that their device can be legally marketed in the jurisdictions where they're interested in selling it, and they will find that to do that, it's ob obligatory to apply to comply with ISO 13485, and 1385 calls up a requirement to comply with applicable regulatory standards. So suffice to say, you have no option in this matter if you want to sell your product legally. Jeff, is that true globally in every single country um, that this applies to, or just say our major markets? Uh, good question. I'll defer that to the slide after this one. Okay. So looking at the um, QMS perspective, so 1385 doesn't specifically call up 60601-1, but it does say you must comply with applicable regulatory standards. And hey, presto, you'll find 60601-1 applies in, in some form or other in all jurisdictions that you're likely to want to sell your product in. I'll just briefly mention MDSAP. It's kind of 1385 on steroids applying to some specific jurisdictions where you can have a single process to ensure that your quality system and your product development complies with requirements of Australia, Canada, Brazil, I think, and, and US. So it's not global, but it does give you broad coverage. And the jury is a little bit out on whether MDSAP is actually worth the effort or not. Uh, we've had expression from a couple of quality consultants that it's a lot of work and it might be not necessarily applicable, it's definitely not mandatory, but that's a topic of another discussion. You'll see along the bottom, I've got document references. So everything I'm saying today, I've tried to include uh, um, a reference to some information to back up what I'm saying. So you don't just, just have to take my word for it and do your own research to find that information. So addressing Tim's question, uh, looking at the different jurisdictions we're dealing with, and this is just a sample of the major ones, TGA, European Commission, FDA for US and Health Canada, but you will find similar answers if you delve into the regulatory requirements of other domains, and that includes Japan, which has their own set of regulations, and in particular China, 
you'll find globally harmonised standards that are very closely aligned with 60601-1. They're not completely aligned because there are some differences, for example, mains voltage and frequency and aspects such as multilingual requirements for documentation. So there are some regional differences, but the core requirements are essentially the same and those regional differences are only in detail, not in specific core requirements. So it's a pretty safe bet that you'll find for any jurisdiction, the equivalent of 60601-1 called up as a national standard that refers to the globally harmonized IEC standard in some form or other. So Tim, does that answer your question adequately? Yes, thank you, that's great. So in terms of an approach to compliance to the standard, and I've given you a brief overview of what's in the standard and the subsequent slides go into a much more significant degree of detail. So here are just a brief summary of the headline documents that you like, might like to think about. I'd like to start off with a regulatory compliance plan. So this is a document that says, what are we going to do to comply with this standard? Now that sounds pretty trite, but you'll find that it will then be your guide and will identify all the things you need to do and all the documentation that you need to prepare in order to comply with the standard. When you're going through audit, having that plan available and a report that confirms how you have implemented that and calls up all of those documents in the form of a checklist will be extremely beneficial in the view of the person who is auditing your compliance. Now, typically speaking, for any project that Genesis is involved with, we have formal 60601-1 assessments done by an accredited third-party laboratory, such as TUV in Singapore, who's probably our preferred laboratory to do this work. So we have a report saying that we're complying with 60601-1. But nevertheless, it's good to have the regulatory compliance plan in place at the start. And that can be broadened out to cover the other standards you're dealing with. So it's one, 60601 is a subset. So you can address the other standards you're complying with in that. Because you've got that plan in place, then the regulators will be convinced that you know what you're doing and you're taking this seriously. And because you have a compliance report in the form of a checklist to say that you've done everything that you said you'd do in your plan, that's very beneficial when you're signing off on your final document submissions, you've actually done everything you said you'd do and nothing slipped through the cracks. So the other documents, um, absolutely critical that you do a clause by clause analysis of 60601-1 at the start of your project, so that you can then know what your team is facing. And you can use that in interfacing with your compliance laboratory to say, here is our view of what we need to do and what we need to comply with. They may come back with a contrary point of view in, on some clauses and there might be a bit of toing and froing. But nevertheless, it gives you a sound foundation. And extremely importantly, it gives your compliance assessment laboratory confidence that you know what you're doing. Um, I will always produce this document early in the process and use that in early engagement with the test lab to say, here's what we think our product needs to comply with. Then you can negotiate with them. They may say other clauses I think might apply that you think don't apply, or they may be unconvinced of your way that you're going to demonstrate compliance, you can sort that out right at the start of your project before you do the work rather than at the end when you have a mad flurry and have to do a whole heap of extra work to make sure that you've got your compliance documentation in order. And the regulatory compliance uh, standards list should not be underestimated also so you know what you need to comply with in terms of all the collateral standards. Going to rip through this pretty quickly, Tim. So interrupt Jeff, if I'm Jeff, can I just ask one question on that? If you just go back one slide and, and then I'll let you rip. <laughs> um, I, I noticed that you've got the IEC 60601-1 um, prefix to the medical regulatory compliance plan. Um, my understanding that there is a, a broader medical regulatory compliance plan and this one is a subset of that. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. This will typically be one tab in a... I would do a spreadsheet with a regulatory compliance against all of the standards. And some of those are clause by clause. Some of those are more of a form of an overview because you can deal with the detail later. Uh, but 661-1 is one tab in that spreadsheet. And I do the clause by clause right up front 
because it really is the guts of what you need to do to make sure that your product's going to be safe and, and comply with the standard and will very heavily dictate your work breakdown structure and project plan. And most of the collateral standards that you need to deal with will be called up by 60601-1 either directly or indirectly. So it's almost your master index to all of the other regulatory compliance stuff you have to do outside of the scope of 13485 and 14971 for risk, which sit over the top of this. But virtually all of the collateral standards, the non-product specific collateral standards will be called up by 60601. And then you may have some additional product specific standards that you need to research as well. So it's okay. a good starting point to formulate that overall compliance plan. Okay, thank you. So in terms of a clause by clause analysis, the standard is quite long, it's several hundred pages long, but it's worth the effort of going through clause by clause to assess applicability. It can actually be quite a cleansing process because you'll probably find that the vast majority of the clauses don't apply to your product. Certainly if you've got a battery pad device that's never connected to the mains, you can probably eliminate about a third of the standard, the clauses in the standard from the start. If you're not producing x-rays, you don't have to worry about that. If you're not a sterile product, you don't have to worry about that. So you can weed out a lot of the stuff that you don't have to apply with because it's not applicable to your product right at the start. And I find that quite a, a relief to have done that, to limit the scope of no, to know what I have to do with in terms of compliance. Nevertheless, you're probably going to end up with quite a long list when you have done that cull. I've noticed here, as I said before, engage with your test lab early and often. And there is an issue to consider if you want to apply the NRTL mark to your product, you may find that you are then constrained to use a laboratory for the testing that can apply that NRTL mark. They may insist on doing some of the compliance assessment and testing themselves before they'd be prepared to apply that mark. Won't go into detail about what that mark means. If you need to know, then it's easily Googled. So Tim, I'm just gonna start now moving into just a bit of a run through of the guts of the standard. So is there any uh, overview or background information you think we need to address at this point? No, I'm just scared by the number of slides you got. So I think you should push through them. <laughs> I'm going to push through this pretty quickly. I'm going okay for time. I'm uh, used half an hour. I want to leave some time for questions. So I'll scoot through this pretty quickly and only dwell on a couple of the ones that are probably most significant and generally applicable. And we can loop back to any of the slides and go through in more detail if someone's got a question. So the first three sections are pretty straightforward. Um, not No need to talk about them in detail, but I would uh, definitely um, encourage you to go through the normative references to see what is applicable to your product and the terminology and definitions pervade this document and are quite important. Wherever you see a capitalized term in the standard that will have a terminology definition. And I would encourage you to not think you know what those definitions mean. Whenever you see one, if you're not sure, work back through the definitions to make sure that what the definition says aligns with what you think it says. In terms of section four, which is general requirements, I've highlighted in bold a couple of the more significant ones. So these are really only setting the scene for your compliance and defining some, in more detail than the definition some of those aspects that you need to address. And the risk management process is particularly important and I have a slide on that following up. I've already talked about the essential performance. It's critical to have your essential performance identified and defined. So the context of this standard makes sense. A couple of other fairly important bits, single fault conditions we talked about before and use of high integrity components. Just as a note on that, if you have a component that's critical to safety or performance, make sure that you have evidence of that. And really good evidence of that is a year old certificate for that component. This applies to things like fuses. If you're using a fuse, make sure it's got your certificate. Otherwise you're going to have to do additional testing on that fuse to prove that it actually does what it's supposed to do. IEC 60601-1 is your friend. Be thankful you have it and be thankful that you are required to comply with it. 
the reason for this highlighted in red, uh, the red is only there because I got this, uh, we've got a copy of the standard as a um, markup where the markups from or changes from the previous standard are marked up in red. So it's not red by way of shouting, but it's a particularly important aspect of the standard. And so a, I'll read out A, where, where the standard or its collateral stand or particular standards specify requirements addressing particular hazards or hazardous situations together with specific acceptance criteria, compliance with these requirements is presumed to establish that the residual risks have been reduced to, an, to acceptable levels unless there is objective evidence to the contrary. When you're doing your hazards analysis, you have an endless process where you have to decide if you've reduced risk or risk caused by hazards to an acceptable level. And how do you make that judgment? What this standard is saying is if there is a clause in this standard applying to your product, which relates to that risk or hazardous situation, then if you have evidence of compliance with the standard, you are deemed to have reduced risk to an acceptable level unless there is some glaring reason otherwise. So that means you can use this as a means of truncating your risk reduction. You can say we have reduced risk to an acceptable level based on the fact that we have evidence of compliance with 60601-1 clause that relates to that risk. And you can use that as your design, design uh, risk mitigation by design cause of having reduced hazard to an acceptable level. So this gets into the depths of risk management, but trust me, you will find a large number of items in your hazards analysis where there, the parameter being dealt with is addressed by 60601-1 and you can use compliance with the standard as your means of demonstrating acceptable risk reduction. Those who've gone through detailed risk management process will fully appreciate what I'm saying. So I won't dwell on this. So this is just, uh, you'll see most of the topics addressed. I've given them my thoughts on how you can comply and the documents that you should be producing as evidence of compliance. So I won't slavishly go through these, but we can circle back if anyone has any questions. So getting into the broader testing requirements. Section 5.1 just specifies conditions and things you should do and number of samples and stuff that you need to test. So we don't need to go through that in any detail. It just provides your guidelines that when you are doing tests prescribed by the standard, what you need to do to be able to comply with the standard. Jeff, what do you mean by a sample? Sorry, by? A sample. What do you mean by uh, If you mean need to test six, but you might need to test three different devices. So apply the test three times to three different devices to show that you are not just testing one that you're lucky that happens to comply. So you might have to test a different number of samples for different tests. So just testing is just that, one. Is that something that range. you can decide for yourself how many samples is appropriate and just argue the case or? Um, uh, to a degree, in, in some cases it defines the number of samples, in other cases it talks about statistical significance and so forth. So it's a case-by-case -case basis, you either have to do what the standard says or if, in terms of a number, or you may have to choose that number based on some sensible evidence that the number you've chosen is a sensible number. If you're dealing with statistical probabilities, then you've got to get into, into statistical tests of significance and so forth. I'm just so you have to do that by proper analysis. I'm just wondering, like from a practical point of view, like I know that Genesis, we've, we've got a project on at the moment, which has got two components. One part is disposable and one is reusable. The reusable one, you know, the, you know people only have one version of it, but the disposable part, there's going to be, you know, literally um, hundreds of thousands of these pre produced every year. Um, in, and the likelihood of, you know, one of those ones having an error, I, I imagine, you know, statistically would, you know, be more significant. So um, how do you account for something that's very low volume, reusable versus something very high volume disposable? Normally, if it's very low volume, you try and show but by verification testing that there is no problem caused by statistical variation in the device. And that can be difficult. Typically, if something that there's a large number and that there is variation from item to item, then you if you can do 
definitive tests during production to show that each device complies with a certain range of parameters, then you may not need to do statistical tests. But if you can't do that, you might have to test 100 units, then analyze the statistics to say, on the balance of probability, the non-performing products are six standard deviations away from the mean. Therefore, we have an incredibly high degree of confidence. But it's that sort of thing that's addressed by this that you may have to determine a number of samples to be tested. And this is not, bear in mind, this is testing not in production, but it's type testing, So, it, but it does overlap. It's a complex topic, and I don't think we can go into any more detail now, but that would be a good topic for a future webinar, how you deal with the dilemma of whether you can do absolute objective verification of every sample or the, whether there are statistical variations that you possibly can't possibly test for. For example, if doing the test destroys the device, then you have a bit of a problem. Thanks, Jeff. Now we need to classify the equipment. So the clauses that apply of the standard depends on the class of equipment. So there's a, a process you can go through and this generally differentiates mains pad versus mains pad earth versus mains pad isolated versus lower voltage pad versus internal battery pad, et cetera, et cetera. And also considers aspects such as sterilization, the use in oxygen rich environment uh, is in an oxygen tent. So there's an increased risk of fire, et cetera. So you do need to work through this and say, what, what which of these things apply to my device? And that in turn will enliven subsequent clauses of the standard that apply to that particular device class. And moving on, we're now getting into the meaty section. And this is a really good example of where the myth that this is only electrical uh, is dispelled because we're talking about marking and identification and documents. So there are many aspects of this that apply even beyond the engineering field. Your uh, document writers will need to be aware of this. Uh, I would emphasize in particular the things in clause 7.2 and the marking. And we talked already about colors of indicator lights and so forth. The requirements are extremely easy to comply with. The only issue you get into is if you don't know what the requirements are and you're not aware of them and you go blindly down the path based on ignorance of the requirements, you can end up in a world of pain at the end. But simply by knowing what these requirements are and applying them and building them into your requirement specifications, you can solve these problems before you even start. So any difficulties you might encounter in a lot of these areas can be just simply removed at the start by knowing what you need to do and building the requirements into your requirement specification. And in particular, things like labeling, things like the color of indicator lights and so forth and so forth. It's really easy to say, the alarm light must be red and the power light must be green. That's pretty straightforward, not hard to do, but if you end up getting that wrong, then you've got a world of pain at the end. So you'll see it in the documents at the bottom, there'll be lots of specifications uh, to specify what you need to do to make sure that you've incorporated into those documents, the requirements of the standard. Uh, you can include things like labeling just in your broad requirements documents, but I tend to like it to have an, in a different standalone specification because the people who will be doing the work to comply with that are probably rather separate in some cases from your engineering team. So it's good if they have can their you, own specification to work with. Just on the labeling, can you, can you just briefly explain the purpose of the labeling? And my, my second question around that is, sure. do, do you have to, um, like I know that um, CircuitWise label individual um, circuit boards, which is a subcomponent of the product. So do you have multiple layers of labeling and what's the purpose of it? It's pretty broad. At the most basic level, it's usability and it links into your usability engineering. Do the labels on the front panel and on documentation and so forth allow the user, are they clear for the user? So that sort of labeling. You then get into regulatory compliance labeling like FCC uh, labels on the back of your thing to say it complies with the requirements. And also serial numbers, labeling on the circuit board revision numbers. If you are required to uniquely identify every item, which is often the case or normally the case, you need a serial number label, et cetera, et cetera. So very broad and it covers not only the not only the user type end, but also the, the design and development documentation labels on circuit boards, for example, earth symbols, or do you have a UL label on the circuit board to show that it's 
meets UL requirements for fireproofing and, and that sort of thing. So very broad and covers just about every aspect of the product design and its manufacturing. Sorry, second question? Uh, no, I think you've, an you've answered it. Um, but it covered both. <laughs> it's good to hear this because, um, and, and people out there who are, you know, maybe entrepreneurs listening in and going, oh my God, do I have to do all this? The um, good news is you don't. Generally speaking, you, you rely on uh, your um, subcontractors to have all this knowledge and do it for you. So um, it's good to get a sense of the depth. And the, the vast majority of these technical things, if you have, if you use your subcontract resources, then they should know what to do and should deal with this for you. If you're using an in-house team, be aware that your in-house team needs to have expertise in these areas, in fact, mastery over this to be able to do the job without a great degree of grief because they'll come unstuck on lots of stupid little simple things if they don't have the experience and knowledge to know what they need to do. Once again, flick through that. Uh, electrical hazards. So this is a big topic. So uh, electrical and electronics engineers, please prick up your ears, but industrial designers don't switch off either because there are a lot of electrical safety aspects dependent on industrial mechanical design. In particular, things like cable routing, cable securing, integrity of cases, whether the case breaks when it drops, whether the water can leak, leak into it, et cetera, et cetera. But there are quite a few areas to address. Some of them relate to mains only, but others you might think they're only mains related like electrocution. I've got a three volt battery that can't electrocute anybody. Well, guess what? If that patient has a catheter into their heart, you can kill them with three volts quite easily. So a conductive catheter. So the current, the requirements for leakage currents, isolation barriers, et cetera, et cetera, do not cut off at any particular voltage. They apply down to zero volts DC. So you do need to comply with those requirements, even for simple battery or low voltage powered equipment. Having said that, the broader requirements come into play where you do have mains in play. Couple of important concepts, means of patient protection and means of operator protection. And this is galvanic isolation barriers, separating the patient and the operator respectively from current that can flow that can cause some harm. The operator protection is essentially 60950, which is I, the IT equipment standard, and it applies to equipment like your laptop computer that you've got sitting on your desk possibly at the moment. Nothing to be terribly afraid of. When you get into patient protection, it's a bit of a different ball game. The standards are much more stringent in terms of isolation requirements. Having said that, they're generally not, it's not rocket science to comply with them as long as you have a clear definition of what the isolation requirements are and where you need to put in isolation barriers and rippling through into the design of your circuit board layout, make sure that the creepage clearance distances on your circuit board and between any conductive items such as wiring are complied with. I've seen a horror case of a device that was actually connected to electrodes connected to the back of someone's skull where they'd used an auto PCB router and routed connections to those electrodes straight through the middle of circuitry that had no isolate, no isolation safety barrier from mains power. So you could have easily had a single fault that would have really killed someone by electrocution because someone had not been careful in doing the circuit board layout and not really understood the requirements. Jeff, can you- It's absolutely essential that the designers doing that um, have this knowledge. Jeff, just for the um, audience members may not be familiar with electronics, um, can you explain what galvanic isolation is as opposed to maybe an air gap? Uh, well, essentially galvanic is voltage. So an air gap provides galvanic isolation. So it says galvanic really means can electric current flow. It's just a generic term. So you need to stop current flowing across that barrier. And that's done with insulation, which is a physical non-conductive barrier or, or physical separation through air or creepage is across the surface. So if you've got a circuit board with copper tracks on it, what is the physical clearance between those copper tracks? And generally that needs to be larger than the air distance because the circuit board can get contaminants on it and it itself has a lower voltage breakdown capability than air. You also need to be 
aware of things like called degree of pollution. Can you get deposition on that circuit board of potentially conductive um, materials or dust coming out of the air? So yeah, and quite I'm, a complex thing to deal with. I know that with um, printed circuit boards that um, there's two steps. Some things they'll quite often um, make sure the board is clean and do um, conformal coating to, you know, prevent any, you know, issues with that dust. Um, and I've, I've also seen extreme examples where um, they're actually x-rayed to make sure there's, you know, um, that any gaps are free of any metallic um, residue. So. There's also a concept here of applied parts. So something that's applied to the patient in normal use is obvious, but this also applied also addresses inadvertently applied parts. So something that can accidentally touch the patient. So if it's dropped or if the patient moves or even if the operator touches it and touches the patient. So sometimes you need to consider a part that's not normally applied to the patient is treated as though it was an applied part because it can inadvertently contact the patient. But let me skip over that. So now we get into some fun and games for the mechanical engineers and mechatronic engineers. I promise you no one would be left out here. Uh, so section nine actually starts off with a table that gives coverage of the sub clauses that uh, address particular items. So you can see down through that list, there are quite a range of things. And also beyond this, there is another section where you're talking about strength and integrity of enclosures in relation to whether they maintain electrical safety if the enclosure can be damaged by being dropped or for example, if the plastic ages and cracks. So these particular hazards in this section relate generally to moving parts. So you can see the sort of items being addressed. Things like falling and instability and so impact may cover a range of equipment. Some of these, for example, crushing and shearing are generally for devices that have moving parts. For example, any robotic equipment or any electrically actuated equipment. So finger trapping hazards and that sort of thing. We won't go through that in laborious detail, but there's a lot to consider. So then getting into the detail, there is specific uh, categories of hazard that you need to deal with and including things like acoustic energy. You'll find a lot of the sections of 6061-1 are quite specific to different equipment types. So they've been added in there as new medical equipments come along onto the market that's in a particular space. So you find a recurrent theme here in terms of the documents you should have, obviously specifications for everything, verification validation plans and reports to show that you have addressed these hazards, that you've got verification outcomes that prove that you have and reports typically from accredited test labs. So you're not just relying on your own in-house engineering reports, you've got accredited reports. So they have more weight in the assessment process than something you've done in-house. Uh, section 10 becomes pretty specific. Generally, this applies to X-ray machines or machines that are intentionally generating radiation, it does include lasers. This is fair, it's uh, not uh, normal for this to apply to most equipment. So it's only if you're dealing with something particularly specific that you might come across. Uh, often, quite a few devices have lasers in them. Um, so you may have to deal with laser safety if you're using a laser for a ranging or indication function. Okay, so moving into another area. So excessive temperatures is quite a critical one. So this court, this addresses internal temperature rise if it can potentially cause a risk of fire and surface temperature rise of devices. Now it's important to note that the issue of single points of failure comes into play here. So you're not just dealing with normal use of the device. What happens under worst case fault conditions of temperature rise for example, you end up with an electrical short circuit and then that's not interrupted by a fuse or other means. Can you get temperature rise that causes you to exceed the temperatures that could cause a fire risk internally or could cause a surface in contact with the patient or the operator to cause them a hazard by way of a burn or even extreme discomfort. So you need to address a single point of failure condition and you can't just rely on a fuse because you can end up with faults that can cause excessive temperature rise that doesn't blow the fuse. 
So in that instance, you might want to consider as a risk mitigation measure, having a temperature sensor that causes a shutdown if an abnormal condition causes excessive temperature rise. That's just an example. So this um, then transgresses into the mechanical for things, uh, handling anesthetics and so forth, which is a pretty specific use case. Uh, but nevertheless, it pays to work through this and make sure that there's nothing in here that applies to your particular device. Uh, in terms of accuracy of controls from instruments, this gets pretty specific. If you're displaying values, how accurate is that value being displayed? Does your me measurement device measure it accurately enough? Does your software meet requirements to make sure that you're not corrupting that value and displaying an incorrect equation, displaying it, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, something that's pretty specific to your device that you need to work through and make sure that you have sufficient safeguards in place in terms of any information you're displaying be sufficiently accurate and your controls actually having accurate markings and so forth. So I'm zipping through these pretty quickly to get on to some meatier ones. Uh, 6366 for usability is a whole new topic and we have had a webinar on this. So I'd probably refer you off to that webinar for information on dealing with usability. But the headline standard that calls this up is 6601-1 that calls up 6060-1-1-6 that calls up 6366 one if you're wondering how that chain works. Um, so I won't go into this in any detail today, but to refer to the webinar that's the recordings on the site to explore this in a bit more detail. Yeah, actually, Jeff, the recording isn't on the site because unfortunately, um, oh, the the, re, the the sound quality was so bad, um, I decided we couldn't put it up, and um, I've had for several months now an engagement to re-record it. Um, might actually give up on that and actually just put up the, the bad recording because I haven't got it here ready to go, but I might just, um, yeah. so it will be- Also, if we, put up the if we put up the slide deck, that would help. Yeah, no, I'll put up the recording because it's, it's you know, we managed yeah. to get through one. So I'll do that in parallel with this one. So it'll be up next, um, early next week. Cool. Yeah. So that's a, that is a big ticket item that you need to address. Uh, where are you? We talked about hazardous conditions and single fault conditions. So this section of the standard goes into a number of specific things that have obviously arisen through where there's been a problem and then there's been a clause put in the standard to address a particular problem. The big ticket item here is a single fault conditions. If you take for an example, your circuit board that might have three or 400 components on it. If you are at a safety critical application, you should go through those three or 400 components and analyze what happens when any one of those components fails, if it's missing, if it's the wrong value, if it fails open circuit or short circuit, analyze what the impact of that on, is on the safety and, and essential performance of the device. A very detailed and laborious process. Beyond that, you have a few lot more obvious things. What happens if it's electrical short circuit, can it catch fire? What happens if the fluid container splits and leaks fluid, et cetera, et cetera. So really comes down to the detailed design of your particular device as to what these hazardous situations are, uh, but you definitely need to recognize them. This section, the hazards identified here should be very closely linked into your risk management process. One thing I didn't really emphasize in great detail is that there is a strong linkage between risk management and 60601-1 compliance. Wherever 60601-1 identifies a hazard or a risk management requirement, you need to link that in to your hazards analysis process. And the assessor looking at 60601-1 compliance will be looking specifically for that. Uh, getting into programmable electrical medical systems, this gets into the software domain. And I'll actually flick through to the next slide. It's quite important. The bits in the green box are within the coverage of 6304, which we have had a presentation on, and there is a, is a presentation up on the website. But 6061-1 goes beyond that. So the bits in the non-green box are covered by 6061-1. They address the overall system and how the electronics and software part of it fits into that. 
and also the validation aspect, where 6604 is only verification. 6601 address validation. Just excuse me a sec. I'll just shut the door. <laughs> This is the uh, just working from home. Um, um, yeah. We're all doing more. When your gardener yesterday. comes and does air blowing of leaves. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, that's, that's not too bad now. I've just got a new um, puppy dog who's uh, about, um, we've had, had them in the house for about three or four days, and I'm hoping they don't wake up. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Is that background noise obtrusive, Tim? No, I'll just go and get them to stop. Just hang on. No, it's, no, it's fine, Jeff. Ah, there you go. Sorry about that. Anyway, for those of you who don't know about new puppy dogs, I've been up since 4.30 this morning when the dog decided to wake up and uh, wouldn't go back to sleep. Uh, it's a bit of a long day. Did get some work done this morning. Sorry about that. I'll do it with you. Um, okay, so where was I? The, so 6, uh, 6.6.1 does have an impact on software, and I'll flip back to the previous slide. So where software can impact safety and essential performance of the device, you then need to address 6.3.0.4 because it's called up by 6.6.1-1. However, 6.3.0.4 applies anyway. So this is kind of a bit of a moot point, but if uh, 310 and 327 apply, in other words, the software can affect safety and essential performance, then you do need to recognize that in 6601 just run compliance and have a specific reference to your 6304 compliance. So suffice to say that uh, we have a deep dive on 6601. Actually, that's, that's an incorrect reference. That should be the deep dive on 6304 that's called up there. Uh, Tim, you hear me okay still? Yes, that's fine. And that just confirming there is a recording July 15 um, on 6304. We had a deep dive on that in the webinar recordings page. Yeah, things just went very quiet. That was a bit concerned I might have dropped offline. Um, the, so section 15 construction, and you'll see here is listed a specific range of tests that apply to the mechanical aspects of the equipment. And there's a lot of interaction between the mechanical and the electrical. So some of these tests are aimed at ensuring that uh, abuse of the equipment cannot cause the enclosure to crack or a gap, gap to open up that then leads to an electrical safety hazard. So there's an inter interaction between the two. But there is this range of specific tests that are called up that do apply uh, that you need to be cognizant of. And then there's a, a judgment to be made about how much of this testing you do in house vis a vis what you farm out to test labs. So I don't need to dwell on systems. Section system on si 16 on systems essentially extends the concept from equipment to systems. So there's some additional considerations, but the general scope of the requirements is similar. And the system is where you've got more than one bit of equipment interconnected. So we're getting to the end and the time is running out. So we have a little bit of time for questions. So electromagnetic compatibility is called up by way of a collateral standard, which is 60601-1-2 that specifically addresses electromagnetic compatibility. This essentially calls up CISPR 11 for emissions, which is a, a, a standard specific to the electromagnetic compatibility domain. But there's a range of other requirements and I've got a, one standard reference there. Electrostatic discharge is one of the most critical ones, but there are a range of immunity standards. These apply in Europe for commercial equipment as well as medical, but in Australia, the susceptibility requirements do not apply for non-medical, but they do apply for medical, so be aware of that. But uh, this standard, collateral standard 1-1-2, gives you all of the details of the electromagnetic compatibility requirements of your equipment. 
And finally, we have a whole range of annexes, most of which are informative, which means you don't need to comply with them. But there are a couple of normative ones, and the one in red was a new one just recently added. It's well worth while working through these annexes and becoming familiar with them because they give a lot of explanatory information about what is the intent behind the clauses and tests you need to comply with. So Tim, probably I think I'd uh, wrap it up at that stage and only refer to any other slides if anyone's got any particular questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and uh, look, for those of you who join late, my name is Tim Kanagita. I'm the coordinator of the New South Wales Active MedTech um, community. And uh, I just want to thank Jeff for um, presenting today. Um, there, um, I think it's a, if you, if you do have questions, please type them in now um, with the, in the Q&A uh, panel. But uh, I think it's the case of one of these presentations where there's just so much detail. I think people are sitting there mesmerized going, oh my goodness, but do type in any questions. Jeff, the one um, thing, uh, you know, I'll, um, I'll ask you a leading question on this because um, I know the answer, but um, there's a, you've mentioned a number of documents and we have a hierarchy diagram that Genesis uses with lit, which lists literally um, several hundred documents that make up a medical device file. Can you just talk about um, how people should approach uh, generating all the documents they need to prove their compliance with IE 601-1 um, and how that generates, um, relates to the medical device file or the technical file. Well, throughout the slide deck, you'll see I've identified documents that I, that I recommend people produce and it's essentially the process that we follow. Uh, it's not the only process and they don't all need to be separate documents. You can have one document covering several topics, but nevertheless, that gives an indication of the sort of documents you should be thinking about producing in the medical device file. Medical device file is a term defined in uh, ISO 13485. You'll also find it aligns with the technical file for CE and the design dossier. There are different terminologies, but I like to use 13485 terminology. It's just the master compendium of all of the documents that you need in support of a regulatory compliance submission. And a subset of that uh, the technical design file is a subset of the medical device file. So the medical device file includes things like verification, validation, um, and all sorts of other activities that you need to undertake to certify a product beyond just the technical. So we produce this so-called hierarchy diagram. It's a structured, doc, doc, structured presentation of the component parts of the medical device or system that also identifies the documents that pertain to those parts in an orderly structure so you can work through it and uh, determine which documents you need to produce as part of your compliance documentation. I'd also like to dispel a myth. Pe people have thought that for a class one medical device, they don't have to do any of this stuff because TGA, for example, do not require it to be submitted. But when you read more carefully, TGA can request for any device at all, submission of the full documentation data pack. So all of the documents that you're obliged to produce, even though you're not required to submit them specifically with any application, can be requested at any time. And your, your quality system auditor, if you have a quality system in place, will certainly be looking to see them. So don't be lulled into a false sense of security that because the regular, regulator doesn't call up submission of the documents that you can get by without having them. Hey, there was one question on here um, from Mark Harrison, which is where does IEC 80601 fit in? Is it just an extension to 60601-1? Um, and I did look that up, Mark. Uh, this is Mark uh, from Mark. Um, and Jeff, that standard is uh, medical electric equipment, particular requirements for basic safety and essential performance of automated non-invasive spigonometers. Um, which um, I should hold a competition to see who knows what a, a spigo anometer is, but apparently it's something to do with blood pressure, measuring blood pressure. So it's a blood, I was gonna say it's a blood pressure measurement pro. Um, yeah. That's a good example of what's called a product specific standard. So it's saying 
for this particular device, there is an additional set of requirements that are not adequately covered by 60601-1, which is generic. And so therefore we've specified some additional requirements. You'll often find those product specific requirements call up some of the clauses of 60601-1 in context, or they may have some new additional requirements. Now I would imagine for this particular device, it's because the it's, an, it's an invasive, intrusive, it's inserted into people's arteries typically, that there are some really particular safety risks that need to be addressed by some additional requirements. And I don't, I'm not familiar with that particular standard, but I'm guessing it has a whole heap of specific tests for sphygmomanometers.